And so, welcome everyone to this new uh, tutorial, uh, which is a collaborative 3D visualization using X3D, Python, and Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we are waiting for the final technical uh, adjustment, and uh, then uh, you may start when, uh, when ready. Okay, well. I believe I have ended the ended the upload, so I think I've got all the bandwidth for this very important application. Welcome everybody. My name is Vince Marchetti. I am a member of the 3D Web 3D Consortium, and uh, happy to be delivering this talk today. Uh, first of all, let me let me confirm that I am sharing the correct screen. You see the title: Collaborative 3D Visualization. Yes. Good. <coughs> I'm, go I'm going to delay a lot of introductory material, but I think it's it'd be fun or be, uh, more excited to jump right into showing you some 3D content. Uh, so I have a live example of a Jupyter notebook, and I invite anyone who's at a laptop to take I, this opportunity. I still, I think you are still showing the uh, the first frame of the video. Okay, well, I'm what sure. I'm showing, and let, let's see. Uh, you, do you see yeah, my I cursor? See, I see your yes. cursor. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> this is so. Actually, my video started with this slide. It's it's all very 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 meta, very otherworldly. Um, because I, I, on my other screen, I'm actually looking at the notebook. So th this is a PowerPoint slide. I put this up here for introduction and also to invite uh, the participants to follow along in sort of real interactive time. So on this PowerPoint slide, and this is really helpful for you because you're viewing it over Zoom, but also in the Whova app, I have included two links and in fact, it's occurred to me, I should put these in the chat, which I will do. I hit the wrong thing. Oh, I'm not copying the link correctly. Copy link, right? How do we copy a link? That's how we copy a link. Okay, I've just finally figured out how to copy the links into, into the chat for the conference. So I invite, uh, and this is, this is a bit of experimentation. I'm not aware of what's gonna happen if of eight or nine of you try to log into this simultaneously. I, I, I hope we can find out as an experiment, but I invite, uh, you to open the, the the best one might be the one called dynamic and interactive that's to the mybinder.org site uh, but if that doesn't work or you get you get tired of waiting um, the, the, the the lower length the one to nb viewer is a static that is a non interactive or an almost non interactive version of the same notebook so um, i like a cooking show where the meal is pre-cooked and just pull it out of the oven, I am going to uh, make believe that I clicked on this link and my notebook showed up right away. So I jump to the view you're seeing and bring up my notebook. 
Okay, so now we're no longer seeing a PowerPoint. We're seeing this notebook. Um, I know, let's see, do I see the hands? Uh, I'm looking to see if I can get some kind of feedback by raised hands or so on, whether you know people are having problems with loading it, uh, or maybe one of the panelists who's trying can ah, give me an idea. It and uh, it works. It, oh. it took a bit to 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 come. Well, I don't know the, the exact time. It was uh, showing a black window on top, uh, <laughs> uh, doing some stuff. But the, I can see the the notebook uh, fine. Well, well, that's great. So, just for those of you who are seeing it, and uh, it, 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 it's in the video, and I'm sure the video will be available in, in well, in and afterwards. Um, but those of you who did it, you might have seen, uh, the, as was pointed out, the black screen. Um, you might have seen a swirling thing. When when you logged in, you were actually launching a virtual machine that had. A certain amount of Python code loaded in, and it started this this notebook. So let me explain using my copy of it here what we're seeing. The, the notebook is a series of cells um, from from top to bottom. The cells which are shaded are Python code, and although I'll be talking about Python quite a bit, you know one of the themes I hope is that this notebook idea is a way for people who are experienced Python programmers, I, you know, I would consider myself <laughs> in that group, can collaborate with people who aren't experienced Python programmers or aren't experienced programmers of any kind or just don't want to do coding. Um, so what I hope to show is that with the, the combination of the code and documentation and, and hints embedded in the notebook, we can allow, again, your collaborators who don't want to be coders to contribute to modify the scene uh, and, and, and contribute to the program. I will go in more detail during the course of the tutorial what, what you're seeing here, but let me just quickly do a flyover First of all, let, let me do with a big reveal. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to clear the output because sometimes we like for the purpose of this, we'll clear all outputs. This is just to so help illustrate. I'll go down what we see in the notebook. Again, we see the Python code in the shaded screen. Uh, we see documentation links, which you or I can, can modify if you find what I wrote unclear. There's a drawing or an image to help us see what's going on. And uh, I just quickly fly over and, and a lot of nothing because we actually haven't run this yet. So I'm gonna show you, I'll scroll back to the top, sort of the most important uh, instruction you can have in one of these notebooks and that is to run everything and that's under the run menu to run all cells we can talk in more detail uh, the python notebook has a little bit of the flavor of a spreadsheet in that you can change one cell and if you run that cell and everything under it which is a command it it, it it sort of does the update correctly. But uh, that can get a little bit complicated uh, or at least get you out of synchronization. And this is a fairly simple notebook, uh, fairly simple calculations. So uh, let me dismiss whatever this was. Let me, let me do the run all. And now I'm gonna, I have to go back down to the bottom. Oh, it didn't run. Okay. Let me try to run all again. Still not there. Is there an error? An error? Okay. It's in that. Okay. So uh, another important hint is for sometimes when things get clogged up, you have to do what's called a restart the kernel. And now we'll try run all again. 
my, still not there. This is embarrassing. Okay, let me die this one. Ah. Hey, it worked. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so th th this is the result of, of, of you know, the, the, the work I've done, or at least running the cell, is we get this geometric figure. And I, I will explain in the next, when, when we're done with this quick introduction, what is the uh, significance of this figure. One significance is that uh, it, it's, again, fairly simple, but does illustrate the, the ability to use Python to do numeric computation and then show it in an X, uh, create the X3D scene and then show it in the browser. It also has the advantage that I'm not using uh, anyone else's data or code, so I can easily make this code uh, open source and openly distributed uh, for, the, uh, you know, for the purposes of the tutorial. Um, I do use this, this notebook for some of my clients. And again, the, the issue there is, uh, that's kind of work for hire. So in my case, I'm not as free to uh, to, to distribute the codes. So I've chosen to go with this example. And I will show you the later why I'm choosing this, but let me just show off some of the capabilities now. First of all, as, as you said, it, or as I pointed out, what we're seeing here is a cone that is in blue uh, intersected by a plane and if you uh, remember some, some of your Greek geometry, uh, the intersection of a, of a plane with a cone is an ellipse. And I've drawn that ellipse in, in, in black around there. Uh, so far, that's sort of a one hit wonder. And, and now we get to the point where you might want, your, one of your collaborators might say, you know, oh, that looks fine. So uh, I want a different looking cone. Uh, I want either a wider cone or a narrower cone. And this is where, again, the, the, the notebook makes it possible for your collaborators to suggest that and even implement it. Uh, unfortunately, we have to go up to find the place. And uh, now it's a question of the quality of my documentation. And if you don't like it, we can fix it in real time. I know where it is, and I happen to know that this quantity called alpha degrees tells you how wide the cone is. And we said, well, 30, maybe one may think that 30 is too narrow a cone. I want to make it wider. So let me increase it to 45. And again, oh, well, I'll, I'll just demonstrate. All I really should have to do is run from this cell downwards or, you know, to the end. And that actually is one of our notebook commands, run selected cell all below. Right. Now, again, okay, I got to see it. And I know perhaps you don't remember, but it's, it has redrawn this figure with, uh, the cone wider. Again, similarly, someone could could argue or, or claim that, well, this is good, but uh, we, 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 we want that plane to be a, at a little bit higher incline. And if uh, that, that will make the ellipse more elliptical. So again, I run back up to my uh, thing there. As the person who developed this, I call beta, and I give beta in degrees, the angle the intersecting plane makes with the horizontal. 15 is a little bit shallow. Um, I am going to increase the 35, make it steeper. And again, run this and everything below. And now let me run down to my final figure. Well, okay, a couple of things have gone awry here. It is, uh, 
it has there, but everything's gotten bigger. So I've got to, I've got to make a few other adjustments because my plane is now doesn't really illustrate what I want to. Uh, let me, since I again, it, uh, my video, I was able to uh, adjust these things. Let me go back up just to, because I want to move on to the next interesting thing. To the same alpha. L let me make my, my uh, cone narrower this time. And that will let me get a, uh, a wider angle. And if you're if you're Python, you you may have uh, if you're a programmer, you may, you may have known I I have this kind of warning here. If if someone does input uh, a combination of alpha and beta that add up to more than ninety, uh, if you think about it or draw little pictures afterwards, you'll see that that means that the plane never intersects the the, the cone the right way. So, but let let me run this and we'll see the picture and we'll move on. I'll run all cells and come back down. And there I've redrawn it that way. Now, I, I will have to say that there is, this is, this notebook is what's called the classic notebook. And that's the only kind of notebook I'm really familiar with. But there is an extension to this Jupyter called Jupyter Lab that my understanding is it would have enabled me to put this window up closer to that code that I was modifying so I could see it. I, would, I didn't have to scroll back and forth. Uh, that, 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 that's a, just a, a let me, it's, it's probably a great user interface idea. It's just I, it's one that I haven't learned how to use yet. And, and you know, I'm sure that there are, or I suspect there are people on this who are you know, also very experienced users of, of these notebooks. And I really, I welcome any suggestions you have either for this notebook or in general that you can share with the rest of us. Now, I, if you excuse me, I, I, uh, I'm looking to, is there a way that I can see if anyone is raising their hand? I, I don't want to keep talking and miss hand raised questions. And I thought that as a panelist, no, I would see. No one, uh, we can probably oh. tell you if someone wants to. OK, interrupt. thank you. OK, well, then this is this is my this is my uh, chance for uh, audience interactivity. So, you know, if, if I were giving this a lecture, I would pose this to the class and ask for someone to, to, to speak up, but I'll just ask you to raise your hand. There's one thing you see in this visualization, and I'll bring it in, is you sort of things in the air. Uh, and that is just because uh, you know, we're, we're specifying using X3D, a, a, a cone and a sphere. And I've done those calculations, which are documented in that image I showed earlier, so that the this larger sphere is sort of exactly inscribed inside the cone. But once you then, you know, in, in your computer graphics, you convert those into meshes and triangles and things, and then you plot them. Due to round off an error and those kind of things, um, the, 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 the mesh for the sphere does seem to pop through the mesh for the cone in a few places. Uh, and, and, and visually, it's kind of distracting. So this is my uh, user, act in, my question to the audience to see who's paying attention or who's engaged is, uh, do I have any suggestions for my collaborators here today about what to do about, or is there a way to fix that? Uh, that visual glitch, if you will. You just write on the on the chat if someone want to right, you write right in the chat or if you want to raise your hand or okay, William, that's a good idea. And actually that is possible. William Glasgow suggested increase the polygon count. 
And um, yes, I, 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 I think that's a good idea. And it is possible. Uh, and we are using, I'm, the underlying rendering here is X3 DOM. And there, there is a way to increase a polygon count. On the other hand, that's kind of, uh, you know, China, it's a little bit of chasing your tail because uh, that increase in the polycon may not necessarily get rid of the artifacts because you're, you're, you're still making a, turning a sphere into kind of a pointy polyhedron and you're turning the cone into a pointy polyhedron. And no matter how many faces you make, they're still kind of pointy and it's possible that the sphere will still pop through. No, that you know, Don, that doesn't work. You can't just call it a feature, not a bug. We're developers, but we're not going to use that excuse now. <laughs> Anything else? It's kind of a, it's kind of a cheat. And when I say it, it might be obvious. William, use Boolean logic. We're tr we're trying to keep things simple. This is for this is for people who aren't necessarily graphics professionals, and I'm sure that if you ask a 10 year old, they would come up with this answer. Okay, you've all got it, okay. This is a little bit of a cheat, but this is my answer. It's a visualization, we're not machining it. It's, it's not a device that, that keeps poison gases from entering our atmosphere. My solution is make that lower, make that atmosphere little that that works again we, we have to count on the visualization being I mean, the documentation being appropriate and later on in the tutorial i can show you how to change the documentation hopefully the, the way that i uh set up my my varying it's it's maybe obvious or you know it could always be better documented but here I've said I, I'm creating a lower sphere. It is X3D based. So we're using a declarative style programming. I simply create a sphere. And I put it in my scene graph and uh, it's gonna be made. Um, this lower radius is something that was calculated earlier, but I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna make it just a little bit smaller. So I'm going to multiply it by 0.99. So visually, you won't see that the sphere is no longer tangent, but it will collapse in. Again, I, I've changed that, and I do my run of uh, selected cell all below. Now we're going to see if it worked. Bravo, it looks like it did. Uh, by making that sphere again, to again to to the to the careful observer, uh, you know it still looks as tangent, and uh, but you lose those visual, you know, you lose those little glitches, and and that's kind of the, uh, you know, we can't for, don't um, forget that when we're making these visualizations, there's always some element of art, and remember, art is the first syllable of the word artifice, which means you're allowed to fake things a little bit in the visualization. And I guess before I, I you know, well, this would have been the end of the pre-recorded part, but I'm doing it live. Uh, we can also can argue about my choice of color. So again, let's remember that our, I've drawn my plane as red. I go up to the place where I'm creating things. Here we go, the plane shape. And uh, th this, this does require a little bit of, of, of familiarity, at least with the terminology of the X3D standard. Uh, you can see that I'm defining a plane it's with some length width. Beta just tells you how it's tilted, but the appearance, if you, you People with some experience in XVD might know that uh, appearance, well, appearance has to do with how it appears. And I'm creating a material, and the material does have a certain color. 
Uh, we use a, this is not physically based rendering. So uh, we, uh, you know, the, the one zero zero would correspond to red being one or 100% and the other two being zero. If I want to make it a green, I can change the red to zero, the green to one, and again, run all and below. And now we come down and lo and behold, it has turned to green. Um, I, I, I do plan to do plan to, uh, you know, return to this and go through in, in more detail, you know, as conditions warrant to, you know, what are the other parts in here? Oh, I should, before I leave, just so he doesn't forget, because I want to give a, an acknowledgement or, or make a connection with the previous uh, session that I know some of you were on. If you go to the top of this notebook, I hope you all notice that uh, one of the Python libraries that I'm importing is X3D. Uh, and I just want to, uh, Don and, and, and Dick Puck mentioned it as part of our Python binding project. And uh, it was mentioned that uh, they, they prepared a Python package, which is distributed. And, and it, that X3D.py is a critical part of this notebook and, and other notebooks I'll show you later. Uh, it, it, again, this, this notebook is really based on Python programming and that X3D.py module is, is key to uh, quickly preparing the X3D scene graph in the notebook. Um, again, if we, if we want to, I can show you because that, that X3D is kind of infrastructure you know, which we import from externally. This notebook does use uh, kind of a custom task library called Common Geometry. And I will say, let, let me just show this feature because it is you know, important that we're collaborating with people. Uh, I explained the way you import Common Geometry. I explained that uh, you know, it's a Python package, which is, uh, uses X3D. We can include that documentation right in the notebook or, or at least directly visible from the notebook. So uh, bring this up and it brings up documentation uh, pertinent. So again, if one of your collaborators wants to see these mysterious functions, cone, sphere, and tilted plane, uh, we, we get the, the documentation, which was automatically generated by a package called PyDoc. Let me return to my notebook. I got that error message. Okay. I think we're still seeing the, nope, I got the one. It looks like I have lost my notebook again. I will restart. Okay, I've seen. Well, while I'm restarting it, let me again give a, 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 a place for us to uh, ask questions or raise your hand and I will restart my notebook. I seem to have clicked things in the wrong order. Uh, also, let me get some reaction where, again, I, I'm kind of curious how this whole format is working. Are the people who have the uh, notebooks or are trying to run it, have you been able to, to you know, make these kind of changes or do you have any questions we want to talk about now? I'm looking at the list of hands being raised. Let me run all again to make sure I do have my nice picture. Okay, I'm back to my nice picture. I should have pointed out, and this is again, one of the things that uh, uh, 
is, is kind of important is that you know, in, in uh, the things that I've done, and I don't know whether it's the, because we have so many people running this machine, but we do have the opportunity to save the changes that I made. If you remember, I'm back to my original picture uh, from the notebook, uh, again, with the red plane, with these visual artifacts. If I had been paying attention or more careful, I did have the opportunity uh, after making every one of those changes to save it, uh, they called save yeah save notebook, and that actually downloads it to your local machine. Uh, as I go into this tutorial, I'm going to point out that uh, it is also possible to run this this Jupyter notebook completely on your own local machine, where you have a little more capability of saving things and and using Git to save your changes. And that actually is how I develop a lot of this work. So the, this deployment on Binder is really to help people who don't have or don't want to have all the Python code on their machine. Before I leave this notebook for a moment and return to my PowerPoint, I just you know want to emphasize this is an important point, is that those of you who are running it know that uh, you didn't have to install anything. This works on any computer with a you know a modern web browser, assuming it opened, uh, you know the Byte Binder opened. You didn't. You did not have to install Python or any of these libraries to use it. That's an important feature in collaborating. Uh, you know, the ease of deployment. Let me put this to the side for a moment and return to my slide set. I like that I've done 40 minutes. I'm only still on the first slide. While we're here, I guess I can quickly open up this. I, I, I'll emphasize the difference between the dynamic and the notebook. I do have this other link called Notebook Viewer. Let me quickly open it. The Notebook Viewer is a, is a much, uh, less complex environment. It's simple, but it does allow you to quickly, pub, you know, in a sense, publish among your collaborators what you've done. So if you just want your collaborators to see uh, any work you've done rather than necessarily letting them modify it, this notebook viewer just gives you the, 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 the view at a certain point in time. So this would be a way of, of communicating uh, your latest work to your team without them having to go to Binder. And in, in a, I do have a slide uh, later on discussing the, 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 how all these different websites are connected. But let me go to my PowerPoint. I also wanna keep an eye on whether there's any chats or whether there's any hands up and I don't see any. So I will press on. Okay. I told you this, I would say, why this figure? Because you know, other, other than the reasons I said is that uh, you know, it, it, it's fairly simple uh, computationally. So everything is, is very responsive and fast and it's, it's open source. And so I don't have to worry about, you know, in, I can freely make all the code available. Uh, this is also kind of something which, <laughs> which I found interesting for a long time. So I'll just give a real quick justification for why I'm doing it. Um, first of all, as I said, that there, it's just that it, you may remember, you've heard somewhere that the intersection of a plane and a cone is an ellipse. And that's this, uh, you know, the, 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 the black line, which is marks out the intersection. If you ever, uh, and then sort of when you were very young, sort of elementary school age, you know, read any books about astronomy, you were heard about ellipses probably as, as the, 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 the orbits that planets take around the sun. And they, all these sort of elementary astronomy books always say, they give us how you draw an ellipse. And this is a picture from a carpenter's YouTube is you kind of uh, put these nails into a piece of wood and a string and you trace out the ellipse. 
And it always kind of interested me is what is the connection between this idea of, you know, tracing out with this, this kind of string construction and the idea of the ellipse being the, the connection, the, the intersection of a plane and a circle or a plane and a cone. Just a, what this is really saying is that every point on the ellipse, the sum of the distance from this nail to the pencil and this nail to the pencil, that sum is always is constant. That's, that's what it means to trace out an ellipse uh, because the loop of string is always the same length. Uh, and then I discovered a while ago the picture from a book that explains what's the connection. And I will not go through the, the, the actual, this segment is equal to that segment and that segment is equal to that segment. I'll simply you know, point out that uh, it's proven and, and actually it's, it's actually kind of elementary if, if you follow the, the, the logic of this line equals that line and that line is equal to that line and, and they all add up the same way. So my actual, the goal of this notebook is eventually to explain this idea with a 3D visualization um, and even add some animation. So as the, 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 the uh, as you trace out this ellipse, you see how all the lines match up. That, that's just uh, why I chose that. The, what, another reason why I chose this figure to, to, to illustrate the power of the notebook. Again, checking any chats or suggestions. Okay, now, now, now we kind of the overview or the, the static part of, of the tutorial, kind of explaining what all these different sites and pages you've seen are, you've been looking at. Uh, if you go on and uh, the, the and I, I guess I, I meant to put the, this link on it, but actually if you, if you do a search for Jupiter and one advantage of misspelling Jupiter uh, in the name of this project is it's very easy to find. I mean, so I, <laughs> I invite you to, to if you're interested, Google Jupiter, get the jupiter.org website and you know, there's more information than you'll ever need about Jupiter notebooks. The way I think of it and the way I use it is uh, a notebook is a task. So in this particular case, the task is to draw this, this geometric figure in visualization. In other work I do, a task might be to uh, read a point cloud from uh, taken by GPS measurements of a construction vehicle to create a mesh from that point cloud and to plot it in 3D as a, a, a 3D, an X3D visualization, and then maybe also color it using the, the height or some other property of the surface. That's a task and you, you could write it as a, again, this is a, a standalone Python program or Python script, but by breaking up into this notebook form, I'm able to work with other uh, people in my company or who I work with who are perhaps not as familiar or don't have the, again, the, the skill or the wish to learn a lot of Python by breaking up some of the simpler things they would want to do and modify into easily understandable commands or, or those kind of entries we can change in cells. I'm able to present, have a task such as prepare cut fill surface and they're able to make some modification on their own to get the visualization the way they want it. So let, let me kind of, oops, I jumped to the end too fast. Am I really at the end? Okay. Again, let me check for uh, chats and, and hands. I don't see any. Um, the, the center of this particular collaborative project is, as, 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 it, as many people, is a GitHub repository. So uh, all these things, are, all, all the work that went into this uh, notebook uh, 
is available on GitHub. I have the link there and, and it, perhaps in a minute we'll look at more detail as to what's in it. I, as I pointed out, I actually developed mostly on my own computer. Um, whoops. So I have a local Git repository and I have a local uh, environment that runs Jupyter on my machine, not in the context of, a, of a, uh, an external server. Although maybe I didn't make it clear, Jupyter always runs in a web page. So when you do have a local Jupyter environment, uh, you're actually running a little HTTP server on your computer and your interaction is exactly the same way. You're interacting with a web page. It's just a web page being served from your local computer. And I've kind of given the hints. Uh, so what goes into installing this? Actually, the installation is not very, uh, it's cross-platform. So at least in the world of Windows, uh, Mac, or the, the, the common Linux distributions, uh, the installation is pretty straightforward. And again, this Jupyter website, which I actually have given a link to the, the installation tutorial on that Jupyter website, uh, it actually installs pretty straightforward. And I do, again, I do my development on the local machine. Then you upload it to, to GitHub. Uh, and then the, 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 these two other websites, which uh, again, I, I know that uh, I, I don't know the exact institutional relationship between all of these, but the binder site uh, allows you to, again, as you, as you may have experienced, run a virtual, a virtual machine that will, again, make your notebook available to others. And there's also this notebook viewer that uh, just gives you a static view. It's a way of publishing your notebook. Uh, both of these, uh, in and at, at, at load time or runtime, do go back and query your repository, your own GitHub repository. So as you as your collaborators uh, make changes or additions to the notebook or all the things you, you can do with GitHub, such as fork and create branches and even roll back if you make mistakes, uh, all those things can be deployed very rapidly and efficiently because it all has this common source in this repository. Um, let me, do, again, I'm asking about questions or comments. And again, I don't see questions or comments or raised hands yet. So I'm actually running toward the, the end of my prepared material with, with the intention where we, we have the freedom of going back and looking at whatever people had a particular question of. So if you have any suggestions of what you want to go back, you know, in my original notebook, uh, the, the, the ellipse and the cone, or uh, if not, I will press on to uh, my next thing. Uh, I didn't realize I somehow I switched out of, out of showing the slides i'm actually showing the powerpoint but that's okay the the the, the uh the example i had of, of the cones and the balls and the plane was, was really kind of simple i was actually introduced to this uh, as part of the the work of the web 3d consortium uh, our design printing and scanning group is very interested in taking uh cad designs computer aided design and, and, and visualizing them in X3D. And one of our associates, Dr. Andreas Plesch, uh, implemented this in the form of a notebook. So I am going, again, I am going to try to loading it in binder and see if we get any kind of, how, how rapidly we go. I'm going to open the hyperlink. Let me bring it in. I will say that one feature of this work by Andreas Plesch is that, and this is, uh, it actually uh, loads a quite 
elaborate runtime environment. Uh, this, these, these instructions you see about opening OCC or from OCC import, OCC stands for Open Cascade, which is quite a large and extensive uh, CAD library that combines uh, C++ code, again, a very large C++ library, and a Python interface that C++ library. Uh, that actually is quite a complicated thing to, uh, to, 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 to actually uh, load onto your own computer. So th this work that Andreas has, where all this stuff is done on a virtual machine, uh, makes it easier. Now, the, 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 the other side of this is that the virtual machine has to load quite a bit of stuff. Oh, here it comes. Okay, so now we're doing... And okay, so again, I if we remember what I have to do is I have to run all. Oh, uh, oh, run all. Okay, we're not getting there, so let me. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I wasn't paying attention. I'm getting this note saying the kernel is starting. This is probably be, as a result of uh, the, 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 the kernel refers to the, the, the underlying Python library, and it has to load all that things with AC, OCC. So let me wait for a limited time. Let me just see what's what. what no, okay, that's mine. That's mine. Kernel starting. Please wait. Well, while we're waiting for it, I'll come back to it again. I will go to the uh, see if I can use Andres's notebook viewer. That is the 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 static view of it. It should load quite a bit faster because we're not trying to actually create a virtual machine. Okay, so the, here you see the result. Uh, what this is, this, this is a, it's, it's a mechanical assembly. This started out as a step file. And those who are not familiar with, uh, with that step is these days is probably the, the international standard for exchanging computer aided design and manufacturing information. So the achievement that uh, Andreas and his, his associates did was to, again, within the context of this notebook, uh, load a step file using the open cascade code, uh, converted to X3D, and, and then rendered it. And we get a 3D you know, visualizable model. With the same opportunity, again, the, the, the open cascade has its own learning curve of, of you know, how you would uh, control it. But this gives us the possibility of, uh, you know, perhaps, a, again, a collaborator who was completely familiar would uh, be able to make some changes. In fact, let me just check the notebook and see if it has been able to start. Let me run all. And did it render it? Oh. Okay, I okay, there this. Hmm. Let me try run all again. Why are we getting number of shapes? List in, okay, I'm not gonna try to, uh, in real time debug, I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, let me just check, 
Andreas, are you on this call? I think Andreas was going to be a, a, a was going to attend. I don't see him. I'm not going to try to uh, debug it in real time. Yeah, I see him in the audience. Uh... Make Andre make Andreas say. Uh, uh, a host, and he can help me fix it in real time. That will be Andreas Plesh. Oh, uh, no, I found another Andreas, so it was not these. Another uh, Andreas. Well, Andre, the other Andreas, do you know how to fix this? <laughs> no, I believe it was the wrong Andreas, but... Uh, not the wrong Andreas, okay. <laughs> so let, let, let me go back, because I did want, and again, particularly because of our hopes, I wanted to go back to my uh, uh, slide here, the, the PowerPoint slide. Because, and one of the, one of the, somebody wrote in the chat a similar thing. And actually, you know, quite honestly, I was not aware of this until very recently, like the last 24 hours, but it occurred to me, I mentioned that this open cascade, which is uh, primarily for computer aid design files, has a Python interface. And uh, you know, I know there are many people here intimately involved with the Mesh Lab application, which I and other people in the, uh, the X3D community have used uh, both to manipulate and process our scanning files. And we're very appreciative that Mesh Lab well supports X3D. And I have to admit, I was not aware that Mesh Lab also has a Python interface called PY Mesh Lab. So uh, I, I, another uh, avenue or thing to do is to is to start creating some of these notebook tasks. Again, I think of them as tasks. Um, you know, given scan data from a certain source, process it, analyze it, convert into a mesh and generate X3D. This is certainly something, you know, we, I, or we can, can take on in the future is, is make these notebooks available. Uh, make make the mesh capabilities of mesh lab available in these notebooks. I'm gonna, since I am inviting uh, a, okay, <laughs> okay uh, William Glasgow, I had a comment. Okay, William, that, that's, that, yeah, that, that he was asking some very important questions about use of digital twins and so forth. And, and that's, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm the wrong, unfortunately, I'm the wrong person to ask about uh, business opportunities in the, in the auto industry. Uh, I, I'd, like, I'd like to be more knowledgeable about it. Uh, you know, CAD is a critical part of, of obviously engineering and manufacturing automobiles these days. And uh, you know, there, there is a lot of interest in using these visualizations now. There, there already are plenty of sites where you can uh, configure your car where you know, in, in sort of real time, you, you paint the different colors, or you add options, you know, different, different trim and so on. Um, but I, at this point, I, you know, something like a standards based solution or even this is more applicable to, um, I, like you said, the sort of the repair and maintenance. And let me just say, this is the environment in which my clients work or the, you know, uh, they tend to be small, well, you know, the, the acronym is small and medium. I would think that most of my clients would count as small enterprises. Now, quite honestly, these are enterprises that cannot afford to pay five figure, and that's a US dollars license fees per year to a particular CAD application. Uh, so these kind of solutions, which rely on, you know, Python, which is essentially free, at least there's no licensing fees. And again, X3D, again, free as in uh, very permissive licensing and free as in uh, at least no upfront cost. Um, 
you know, I, I think there's a lot of future in these small and medium enterprises for this kind of solution, again, to, to keep down their, both to keep down their, their software deployment costs and also to get them out of the rat race of having to uh, always upgrade to the latest version, which is another factor. But um, I have kind of come to the, to the end of, <laughs> as in Free Puppy, um, okay. Uh, well, and, but but I, I say I, I'm helping. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. You had a comment about Mesh Lab. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, the 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 Pi Mesh Lab is uh, a bit new. So yeah, it's something that uh, yeah. came out recently, and uh, we are working on that side because we always needed some way of scripting uh, Mesh Lab, and now we are trying to do it through uh, through Python. And yes. um, and Paolo Cignoni, which is the main developer, has just written in the in the chat uh, that uh, they are doing experiment on Jupyter Netbook notebooks, and they are trying to they were trying to figure out which was the best way to display the the data as it was uh, computed by by mesh lab and uh, x3d is probably one uh, good option to do to do so so yes you probably need to 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 get in touch and uh, and work on that side to to ensure the full uh, compatibility yes well uh, like and and you know maybe this is an opportunity to go back and look at some of the code again the the, the power of this x3d python package is that um, it 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 expresses sort of the what I, what I would consider the the large and mathematical part of a point cloud which is a point cloud is a, is a lot of coordinates of individual points uh, python in, Along with uh, the, the sort of the, the 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 NumPy, which is a pretty standard numerical package for processing, uh, and as if I, I use in this notebook, that's a great way to handle large amounts of coordinates. And it, there is a direct conversion from the NumPy coordinates to put it into what we call a point set in X3D. That's kind of a one-line statement in Python. Uh, and I can go back and show you the notebook. Then there is again sort of a, a, it takes up two cells, but you can put it in one cell to, to take your X3D instance and convert it into uh, the form that X3DOM wants, which is what we call the HTML encoding. So I can, since we do have a little bit of time, I can go right back to that in our original notebook Uh, here it is. Just, just to give you an overview of, of how this works, um, I have created at this point a scene graph, and I called uh, uh, I call the figure uh, the, the word figure. Jupiter Lab is complaining. Uh, I've appended all my parts, and the last thing I do is I append an ellipse, and this, this is sort of the entire rendering phase. I put a little bit of HTML, stop complaining, I put a little bit of HTML, which sort of sets the dimensions as a, as a as CSS style. Um, oh, oh, also, this HTML actually loads the X3 DOM library. And then the next step is to uh, a little bit of X uh, boilerplate HTML with a, an X3D node, which is uh, sort of recognized by, maybe if I restart this, it will stop complaining. Well, it did stop complaining. Uh, and no, it didn't stop complaining. <laughs> okay, it's gonna complain. But anyway, the, the point is this, this is my, this is my, this is the entire rendering part is 
know, simply take the instance which we created with uh, the X3D package and just this as this SC stands for scene. It's a, a, an instance of the X3D scene node. The HTML5 just puts it out in HTML encoding and it's sort of inserted into this HTML markup. Uh, there's a little there's a little script which you know this window x3 dom reload is just a, a fires off a javascript to tell the uh the x3 dom library to to re essentially to do the rendering uh using webgl but as i say that this notebook uh prime you know, most of the cells in this notebook are not devoted to preparing the rendering. They're devoted to do this calculation based on the different angles I set up. And anyway, and Paolo has pointed out that they're already using NumPy in PY Mesh Lab. And, and that's, I, I completely agree that uh, NumPy is the way to deal with uh, scan data, at least, you know, up to a very large thing. And, uh, I'm not sure why it's in. Maybe I should just reload it. And uh, NumPy is, is really quite compatible with using our, our X3D library to change your list of coordinates into, well, in X3D, our point clouds are rendered with point set. And if you do the creating a mesh, we have X3D supports several different mesh types your index triangles, triangles, face sets. So that's how that works. Again, I'm, if there's any suggestions or more things you wanna see, maybe it'd be best if I simply, again, reloaded this notebook and it will make it a little bit easier to uh, hopefully if we, if we go back to ask questions. So let me load it one more time. And I should probably get rid of all my notebook, all my pages, which I know no longer work. Dead kernel. Okay, I'm back, I believe, with a live kernel. So uh, run all cells. And we are back with our figure. So okay, Don Don is Don is has expressed uh, right. Uh, 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 an ability or a willingness to cooperate with uh, preparing that glue code that will help X3D work better. Re really, it's that X3D would, would uh, accept uh, NumPy directly. And, and Don, this is, you, you're familiar with this. You know, you're familiar with the idea of, of typing in Python. And the Python native types are list and tuples. And we would just, or you or we would just want to make add NumPy arrays as an additional allowed typing for those large coordinate sets. So pretty straightforward. Are there any, uh, you know, uh, again, I, I, what I would like to do now is, is open it up for people. I mean, we can go through this and if there's any particular part of this notebook you would like to uh, look in more depth at, you know, maybe not so much the calculations, which are, are correct because the figure plots correctly, but, uh, you know, features like, again, it is fairly straightforward to, to add an image to, uh, the, 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 to the notebook. And this, my drawing here is not nearly as elegant, I think, as the, This is this, I believe, is a much more elegant sketch of the geometry than than appears in uh, this. So, 
But really, I have something to aim for. And of course, this this very neat kind of woodcut looking thing. Uh, but again, the, the the point of this is is to, is to, you know, in the documentation, point out, you know, give some flavor of the geometry. And uh, this cell is what's called a markdown cell. If you're familiar with markdown, it's it's the structured text that you can use in notebooks. And so, in this markdown text. You can also include these uh, mathematical symbols, such as the little angle sign. Uh, and and the, the full markdown is fully compatible with Unicode. So in your, in your markdown, you can have all kinds of symbols uh, available. Okay, so again, I I would prefer to uh you know not 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 so much go in the places I want to go to, but if there's any again further questions or hand raising, uh, let me allow you to do that while I drink. Yeah, I will point, and I, I, you know, in fairness, maybe I will point out that uh, the Jupiter again. If you go to the Jupiter.org site, there are a number of of packages which support three D visualization. So this is not the unique way to do three D visualization. Most of the three D visualization tools, which are you know sort of commonly described on that uh, Jupiter site are really aimed at, at doing the equivalent of 3D graphs. So uh, 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 a plot with three axes and you, you, you simply plot some kind of data or, or fit curves to it. Uh, so in that sense, uh, or at least I, I, I see the, the, the particular role of, of X3D in these notebooks is it's kind of complementary to the idea of, of drawing a, a, a plot, you know, with three axes and a bunch of data points. You know, the, the, the figure I've had here really is a geometric figure rather than some plot of some kind of data. Likewise, the work that, uh, that Andreas and, and, and the folks with Open Cascade did, you know, they're not, they're not plotting data, they are plotting the, the real geometry of a manufactured object. So, uh, yes, answered it, Nicholas. Uh, so, Nick, Nicholas, to answer your question, Nicholas asks XVDPY exposes the SAI to Python coders. I think, in, in spirit, you're correct. The way I look at it is, uh, what X3DPY does is it enables you to construct the scene graph in Python code. And that might be exactly what you said, but I use different language for it. Um, and maybe, uh, I, again, for the people who are kind of familiar with Python, um, I can show you some of the convenience classes I think this will bring up, yes, okay. So this is Python code and you'll either recognize it or not. But the, the, the point is that uh, my convenience class for sphere enables me to generate the shape of the sphere using the X3D, uh, the, the, the class from X3D called sphere. And this is, the, this is the X3D spec for how you define a sphere, which just by the radius. And then you construct the little fragment of, of the X3D scene graph, meaning you enclose the sphere in a transform and you move the transform up where it needs to be using this uh, translation field. Uh, so again, what I think of the X3D package uh, is it, it lets, you, lets you construct the scene graph in a very direct way. And that's, that's the, you know, the whole power of the declarative style. And again, this is, 
I'm not trying to I'm not trying to circumvent the X3D specification by defining my own class called Sphere. It's just for this very particular application, what I did for this figure was several times I made a sphere and I moved it up to a position. And so, you know, again, rather than repeating that code several times in my notebook, I encapsulate it into a Python package. You know, there may be other, as I can, a notebook is a task. There may be other tasks where a different way of presenting the sphere is, is the useful way. So uh, when, I, when I define a special function called sphere, it's sort of a very task specific uh, function or class. You know, and, and, I, and I may have a very task specific definition of an index triangle set, which is pertinent to uh, terrain models constructed from GPS readings. It's not meant, it's not, you know, really intended to be added to the standard. It's a task specific extension, kind of similar to what we, in, you know, in pure X3D might call a prototype a sort of a one-off pattern. Again, I, I am. I, I, I guess I. Um, I really enjoy these discussions. I think that's that. That's the uh, uh, you know the, the best way to go from here. Um, I, I'm available for other discussion, or if you organize, I know it, it may be getting a, a sort of later. I know it's been a long day because I believe that the first session, at least in in. Uh, and it was H Adam, which was seven hours ago. So it's, is that right? That, no, nine hours ago. So uh, I know it's been a long day. So uh, well, we, we, okay, have a no after the, uh, we have a session also after this one that oh, starts at uh, it's a seven, long day, but it's not uh, 7 over. PM. Yes. But um, <laughs> you're right. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a major issue if you, uh, if you think you have finished uh, now, we can I, I, I have if finished. The, and uh, if the other, if someone has uh, more questions, yes. comment, and thing to to ask, and I say, I'll, I'll be happy to stay on. I, I yes. especially like the fact that in in the end, after you created that shape, uh, the notebook also displayed the, the X3D um, uh, XML code. That, that's, you're, you're, you're correct. That is an important really thing which I've got because, uh, to. Uh, yeah, you, you have the you have the dynamic uh, notebook, and then you have the static notebook. But in the end, if you just wanted to create uh, an object, you create a parametric object, you create a parametric visualization. In the end, it's just well, um, I, I don't care about the calculation. I just can copy the model that I created through the notebook and I'm ready to use it in any other web page I may need to. I, you know, I'm very glad that you reminded me of that. I, I did, if, if that point is actually in the recording, <laughs> which we were unable to play. But, but let, me, let, me, let me just, for those who didn't catch that, I'll bring this back up. Uh, and this is not an, an automatic, you know, this is not done automatically. This was a feature. I put this in as an option. Let's go down. Um, I see it's let me, the let, result yes. of, a, of a cool yes. uh, um, yes. right XML. Right. So I, I, yeah, I mentioned at the moment, that, at yes. the moment your video is uh, kind of um, pixelated, but uh, yeah, we will try to see if it comes better. So okay. if, for the people that uh, already opened it, the, the notebook is just at the end of the of the first notebook that was shared. 
So after the 3D visualization, there was the um, XML code. So now it's appearing also on the on the screen. And now it's yes. appear, disappearing again. But yeah, it, it was visible for one uh, one moment. Yes, just, just a, a few details. So the uh, Yes, you can see that it was very simple for me to add the, the option of printing out the XML. And again, this is, this is a fairly compact X3D model. So it's, it's sort of reasonable, as you said, to simply put it into the, into the notebook like this and uh, you can copy and paste it into an X3D file or a text file to save. It is also possible either on your local installation or even on this uh, binder to save this text to a file and make it available for download. So, uh, and then, you know, the, we, we call this the XML encoding, which is a, a, in detail, it's a little bit different from the HTML encoding, most notably in that you, you can have those self-closing nodes such as you see in the background node there at the top of the screen. But yes, I'm, I'm glad you reminded me of that, is that uh, we do have this extra option of, of getting the X3D, the X3D uh, available as text for archiving or for inclusion in whatever content you're creating. And I, again, maybe I should also, uh, again, emphasize that even though my, uh, you know, my, the example I showed was very simple, a few cones and spheres and planes. There's nothing sort of stripped down or, or it, this is not a light as an L-I-T-E uh, or a mini, miniature version of X3D. This is the X3 DOM JavaScript library it supports, you know, great supports the, you know, most of the uh, X3D standard, including the, uh, the GLTF inlining. So it would be possible in the context of this notebook environment to import and, and display a GLTF file. And I probably should have included that as an example. Supplementary material. So are there any questions or comment uh, from the audience? Seems that is not the case. No. So we thank you uh, okay. to all the attendee and we uh, thank the speaker for the yeah, interesting uh, talk. Um, we can have a break uh, now, and for the people interested, there's a workshop at uh, that start at uh, 7 p.m. So yes. we may see you there. And uh, thank again for everyone that participated to this um, this tutorial. Okay. Here, I know Don for some reason asked me to stop screen sharing so we can see my with everyone else. So. Hello, everybody. <laughs> if you send us the video, we will uh, put it yes. on uh, the, um, the website and, yes. the, um, and the Vuva channel and the YouTube channel. Yes, I, I, will, mm -hmm. I will resume. I, I guess I'll have to restart that download, but I will do that in, you know, right now or, yes, very near future. After I get more coffee. See you later then. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending.